Well, I'd like to welcome you again to the St. Timothy's Creation Care Series. Uh, this week's presentation is on your food print, how your choices of food affect your carbon uh, emissions and the effect you have on climate change. As I think you all know, we formed this series so that we could learn new ways that we can influence uh, the, uh, the climate through the choices we make and around our own homes. I was absolutely uh, floored when I learned that there are, that 40% of the emissions from, uh, from the United States to the, to, in greenhouse gases are the result of decisions we make around our homes. And so we want to be able to uh, make better decisions and reduce that. Let's start with a prayer. Almighty God, in giving us dominion over things on earth, you made us fellow workers in your creation. Give us wisdom and reverence so to use the resources of nature that no one may suffer from our abuse of them and that generations yet to come may continue to praise you for your bounty. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. So tonight our speaker is Annette Trail speaking on reducing your carbon food print. Um, as, as I just said, food and the environment gets into all aspects of food, not just uh, you're eating it, but growing it, transporting it, and wasting it. And all these are choices. Okay, Annette, take it away. Well, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, we have a two-part presentation, uh, as Bill mentioned, uh, followed by a Q&A and uh, discussion groups. Uh, during the first half, I'll share with you what I've learned about the impact of agriculture and food production on the climate. And then during the second half, we'll focus on food waste. Um, I hope that by the end of the talk, you'll feel um, empowered to make more informed choices about what you're eating. Okay, let's jump in. So, um, over the years, you know, I've had friends that have chosen to change their diets and their lifestyles, uh, primarily, you know, to support animal welfare and to improve their health. But more recently, um, people have been deciding to uh, choosing to eat a plant forward diet to save the planet. And that kind of sparked my interest. I'm like, you know, can we really make a difference um, by what we choose to eat? And by plant forward, I mean not necessarily entirely eliminating uh, meat or uh, from our diet, but basically doing what the doctors always said we should do, which is eat a lot more vegetables. So lately, um, I've been reading a lot of things in the paper too. Um, things like the world's cows are the sixth biggest emitters of greenhouse gases. I was like, really? Is that really true? Um, buying locally is not necessarily the solution to reducing greenhouse gases and meatless Mondays they can actually help make a difference so as these uh, as I started reading these things I became kind of more curious can I really make an impact on the climate by changing what I eat so I decided to do some investigation so as we learned from our presentation last time, food and agriculture do have a huge impact on the environment. So not only does it contribute to 26% of global greenhouse gas emissions, but we use half our land and 70% of our fresh water on agriculture. And it's the cause of 78% of the pollution that we have in our oceans and fresh water. It also greatly decreases the amount of um, biodiversity that we have. We crowd out other wild species. And so uh, tonight though, we, the focus of the presentation is on this 26% on how our impact on global greenhouse gases. So if we look at the food production, like Bill was mentioning, how does that 26% break out? Um, that 26% is equivalent to about 14 gigatons of CO2 equivalents each year. 5% comes from packaging, 3% from retail, 4% processing, 
and the other 80% are a combination of how we use the land and change it to farm on. It's the farming itself and the production of animal feed. Well, if you're like me, what you've been hearing lately is it's all about buy local, buy local. That's been a really effective marketing, uh, you know, and that really in and of itself doesn't have a significant, very significant impact on greenhouse gas emissions because transportation I've read in different places is anywhere between, uh, you know, only causes four to 6% of uh, CO2 emissions. So um, the other piece of the buy local, um, you know, certainly it makes sense in California to buy local because local means we get fresh uh, tomatoes, fresh strawberries, fresh artichokes, everything is nearby and it does make a great deal of sense to buy local. But it doesn't always pay off that way. It doesn't always play out that way. Uh, one example is um, buying tomatoes in the UK. When you buy local tomatoes in the UK, you're buying hothouse tomatoes. That takes a lot of energy to produce those tomatoes. In fact, it's actually better for the environment if you buy tomatoes from Spain where um, they don't have to use all the greenhouses and it's just a, um, a naturally more suitable environment for growing tomatoes. So buying locally, um, I guess the message is do it when it makes sense to do it. And of course in California, we're lucky we have it all in our backyard. The other important message about buy local is definitely avoid any kind of flown in product. Um, just because aviation has, um, and airplanes have such uh, a massive impact on CO2. So then where should we be focusing? We should be focusing on this other 80%. So let's take a quick, um, uh, just switch gears for a minute and remind ourselves that not all gases are created equal. We learned this last time too, when we were talking about nitrous oxide that's produced from when you fertilize the crops. Um, we tend to focus a lot on carbon dioxide as um, the primary emissions from industry, but methane is second on the list. And it's also uh, very damaging because it traps 25 times more heat in the environment. That 40% of that methane actually comes from ruminants. And that's just a really nice way of saying cow burps and waste. So um, a lot of the um, greenhouse gases that come through agriculture and farming are um, methane. And that, um, that those cows, we have 1.5 billion cows in the world. And if together they produce about two gigatons of CO2 equivalent per year, so they're methane, it's converted into CO2 equivalents, it's two gigatons. And if, you, if cows were a country, they'd be the sixth largest emitters of greenhouse gases. It's just crazy when you think about that. So let's go take a look at the um, supply chain again. And it turns out that not all foods are created equal either. So if you look at beef toward the top, you can see that um, it produces about 60 kilograms. I'm sorry, it's a bit of an eye chart, but it produces a lot more CO2 equivalency than, um, for example, nuts or veggies down at the bottom. That's because um, converted, the, you know, it's the methane that they produce converted into CO2 equivalents that is so damaging. So both beef and lamb are uh, ruminants and uh, they belch up a lot of methane and therefore have a much bigger impact on the environment. Pigs and poultry are about halfway down the list. Again, um, they're not ruminants and so um, it's not as much of an impact. And then by far the veggies and nuts at the bottom of the list are, um, you know, have the least amount of impact. And in fact, nuts, because their trees are actually, the trees themselves are carbon sinks and therefore nuts are almost carbon neutral. So the message here is that really plant-based products 
are 10 to 50 percent, are 10 to 50 times uh, lower impact than animal based products. So I came across a TEDx talk by Peter Newton. He's an assistant professor at the, uh, of environmental science at the University of Colorado Boulder. And he sums it up quite nicely. So just bear with me for a second. I'm going to um, switch over to his TED talk. If we want to fight climate change, if we think that individual behavioral changes are part of the solution, and if we want to address our emissions from our food choices in particular, are there choices we can make that would help? Absolutely. The data consistently show that dramatically reducing or eliminating our consumption of animal products would vastly reduce emissions from the food system. Compared side by side, all animal products generate higher emissions per kilogram of product than do plant proteins. But not all animal products are equal or as on George Orwell's farm, some animal products are more equal than others. <laughs> and specifically, from an emissions perspective, cattle and sheep products are much worse than other animal pro products. And that's because cows and sheep are ruminants. Their digestive systems generate enormous volumes of methane in a process called enteric fermentation. Put more simply, cow burps are really bad for the climate. And so, perhaps surprisingly, this and other meta-analyses of multiple independent life cycle analyses show that the production of extensively grazed, grass-fed beef can generate much higher emissions than intensively raised feedlot beef. And that's for at least two reasons. First, Grass-fed cows take longer to reach slaughter weight, so they're alive for longer and belch out more methane. Second, grass-fed systems require much more space. In many parts of the world, this means clearing natural vegetation to create pasture land. In the Brazilian Amazon, where I do most of my research, the creation of cattle pasture is the leading cause of deforestation. Chopping down forests releases vast quantities of carbon dioxide. It also removes habitats that are critical for other species to survive. So, you may not be concerned about climate change, or you may be concerned, but think that food choices are not the way that you want to address your personal carbon footprint. And there may be some rationale in that. A recent study suggested that the individual actions that are most likely to have the greatest impact on climate change mitigation are having one less child, flying less, and making greener personal vehicle choices. But eating a plant-based diet is next on that list. And there's a critical distinction between some of these behaviors. We will all, at most, only ever make a handful of decisions about how many children to have, and decisions about what car to drive maybe every decade or so. In contrast, we make food choices every single day. Adopting a more plant-based diet, or at very least, one that dramatically cuts back on cow and sheep products, including both meat and dairy, is probably the single biggest immediate action that most of us can take to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We all have the opportunity to walk out of here tonight and choose to reduce our carbon footprint. So I thought his uh, talk was quite compelling, you know? Um, it, it made me realize that, you know what, uh, regardless of whether you choose to, um, you know, eliminate animal products completely from your diet or just reduce the number, you can have a significant impact. And another a couple key points, um, one, I thought it was interesting that, gosh, just buying sustainably is kind of not enough. That in fact, um, these cows that are grazing longer on the green pastures uh, are actually have a higher impact. That was kind of very surprising to me. And, um, and that, you know, other things that I had read were that if we truly do um, 
you know, because especially in the U.S. and other Western countries, we eat like three times more uh, meat than the global average, that if we do adopt more of a plant-based diet, that we could um, significantly reduce emissions 60 to 70 something percent in some cases. So this is actually quite compelling. Um, but how does that actually, you know, boil down to, you know, what impact I can have? So I did the math a little bit differently. I said, okay, let's just focus on beef for a minute, even though it's really all meat products do have an impact. Um, and if the average person in the United States uh, eats about 60, 26 kilograms of meat or of beef a year, and we just cut that by half, that's just kind of arbitrary, but let's see what happens. We cut it by half, um, that's 13 kilograms of beef, and that actually saves 100, uh, 780 kilograms of CO2 equivalents. That's like driving 2,000 miles or using or saving 4.5 barrels of crude oil. And that's just one person. Imagine a family of four. So that kind of ends the first part of my presentation. I wanted to know if there were any questions at this point. If you um, want to either speak up and unmute yourself or um, type a question in the chat, I'd be happy to answer that. Bill, can you see? There are no questions in chat at this point. Okay, so I'll keep going. And the second part of the presentation is on uh, waste. And I'd just like to share some statistics. So um, not surprising to many of us, I guess, um, up to 40% of the food that we produce in the United States is not eaten. That's incredible. And that's 30% globally. And all that while, you know, 800 million people go hungry. And we know that our food um, supply uh, system is broken, but, you know, it's significantly broken. 8% of that wasted food that food is equivalent to 8% of global greenhouse gases or 4.4 gigatons of CO2 equivalency. That's, you know, much more than just the cows. If global food waste was a country, it'd be the third highest emitter of greenhouse gases. And I verified that in a couple of different places. Just incredible. So how does that um, you know, play out around the world? Well, as you'd expect, um, the developing countries uh, waste somewhat more food than the developing countries, about 60-40 split. And in developing countries, most of that waste comes at the front end because of um, poor transportation, poor infrastructure to cool the foods and poor storage and handling a lot of that food is lost up front. But in developing countries, we have um, pretty good infrastructure and most of the food actually comes in the consumption end. So whether we're buying food in restaurants or uh, grocery stores or we're buying it and eating at home, um, individuals, the consumers are making uh, choices about um, you know, what they do with that food. So here are some facts about food waste. One trillion dollars of food is wasted annually. And this is global. 30% of global food production, or about 1.4 billion tons of food is wasted. That's responsible about 8% of greenhouse gas emissions, as I pointed out before. And the sad thing is that about 68% of the discarded food is still edible. So where is it happening? Again, it's almost an even split between whether it happens at home or whether it's happening in supermarket restaurants and business. So I think the, the good news, if there's good news here, is that we can make a difference. It's happening in our homes. It's happening at the restaurants. We 
So at least on the food waste end, um, definitely in a developed country like the United States, um, a lot of that um, falls on us and we can make a difference. So just to wrap up, you know, what are some of the things we should consider doing? Well, first, I guess the message is eat less beef. I don't want to advocate not um, because it does provide nourishment and it actually does um, help feed the quote unquote feed the land as we learned last time. It helps to fertilize. Um, the other thing we can think about is choosing a more plant forward diet. So that's just, you know, cut down on the meat and make smart choices about the meat we eat and eat a lot more vegetables. And then lastly, definitely planning your meals, shopping, and then actively trying to reduce waste um, by making those um, decisions, um, you know, proactively and trying to minimize that waste can have a tremendous impact. Well, for some, it may feel like, oh, I'm doing this already. For others, it feels a little daunting. I wanted to let you know that you're not alone in this. Um, there are a lot of good uh, people trying to do the same thing and a lot of resources out there. So uh, the first one I just want to draw your attention to is the Meatless Mondays. And I didn't realize that this actually came out of the 1940s and was part of like the efforts and rationing that um, this particular uh, organization, Meatless Mondays, has all kinds of great resources for how to start these types of movements at work, you know, um, at schools, in hospitals. And not only that, they have a ton of really good recipes to get started. So that's one place I would point you. The second is um, a, a little secret thing I do is I, I love going to browse the new book section of the library. They are organized by subject area. And so I go right to the cookbook section and I pick up whatever the latest cookbooks are. And it's so much fun because you get to uh, you know, try out a few of the recipes. And then if you truly like it, you can buy that book. The one I most recently bought was uh, Mostly Plants by um, the Pollen family. So Michael Pollan was the author of uh, Omnivore's Dilemma. Some of you might be familiar with that about um, you know, just the whole um, food uh, supply chain in the United States. And um, anyway, it's a great book. I highly recommend it. It uh, you know, has um, everything we've tried out of it so far has been great. Um, another, at the, on the restaurant side, um, I was interested, I, I found out that there's something called Menus of Change. It's a movement led by the Culinary Institute of America and Harvard School of Public Health. And what they're trying to do is, again, uh, make smarter choices in what they're serving in the restaurants, reduce waste, and that whole effort is focused on, you know, the restaurant industry, which I thought was great. And then lastly, Feeding America uh, is um, an organization that helps distribute rescued food to the food pantry. So remember all of that uh, food that's being wasted that is actually still edible. Well, what this organization does is they will work with restaurants or grocery stores and pick up uh, food that is still um, edible and make sure that it gets distributed to people that really need it. So there are, um, you know, the, I think the message is uh, pretty clear that we can make a difference and it's great to know that um, there are organizations out there doing it and we can do the same. So again, um, are there any questions at this point? I'd be happy to. Yes, uh, Don Mariska has asked a question. How helpful are the food waste collection systems that some communities offer? Uh, how helpful are the food waste collections for like composting? You might, Don, are you still on? Can you unmute and? Uh... Uh, yes, the, you know, the little green buckets that we get to put in our homes and fill up and then uh, put in the green waste uh, thing. I and they... I don't have a number, but based on what Mint was saying last time, um, you know, it's absolutely much better for that, um, that uh, compost to go back into the ground uh, than it is to end up in the garbage. In fact, she was suggesting that you take that compost out and you um, bury it in your own backyard <laughs> or put it right on top of the soil so as not to disturb any more CO2. So 
I think it is definitely one of the big movements around the country and it's definitely having an impact. Um, but again, I think, you know, we have to do a lot more work on the restaurant side and, you know, on the consumer side to reduce waste too. Well, the carbon's already in, it's already, it's already been put in, put in compost. One of the other options like that, Don, is, um, is what they call worm composting. I have a little uh, barrel in my garage that's um, a little bit larger than a, a five gallon bucket. And uh, all of the food scraps from the kitchen go there, uh, except the ones that contain grease. So animal waste and stuff doesn't go there. But um, all the vegetable waste goes there. And it, uh, in a matter of a couple of months, it turns it into something you can spread on your, uh, on your garden very easily. And uh, it's made in three layers. So you're constantly putting, um, waste in the top layer and then you pull the compost out the bottom layer and put the empty layer back up on top so it's just a, a rotation system and it works really well the other question that don says or maybe it's more a comment some new technologies like appeal are extending shelf life of food to um, reduce waste which is another step in the right direction yeah there's a lot of work being done too on um, the dating um, that right now we have this uh, convoluted system of identifying, you know, what's still good, quote unquote, um, you know, best by a certain date or expires on a certain date. And they're working to try to make that more meaningful because a lot of the stuff that um, hits those dates is still actually really good to eat. And Wild also shared that she's really enjoyed a sustainable food, no waste company called imperfectfoods.com. And do you want to say something about that? Yeah, it's a it's a company that I assume in good faith <laughs> is rescuing food that would have otherwise gone to waste um, due to some imperfection in the produce or some over um, production. Um, it's yeah, food waste is something that really irks me because all the energy that goes into producing that fruit or food is then wasted. So um, not only using what is in our refrigerator, but the food that we buy so that we're not, um, then it, it consuming more energy by using food. Um, yeah, and so I was already, trying to- yeah, the carbon It's already released. Um, you yeah, know, as part of producing the food, you've already released a lot of CO2 yeah. or whatever, and then um, wasting it, you're, you know, right. it's even greater. So right. It's like double impact. Yeah. Yeah. So I've, I really enjoy that, and it comes right to the door. So it's perfect for COVID 19 times. I, I like it even more than some of the other locally sourced um, produce companies that I've used. Um, I, I just think it's really good. What was the name of it again, Anne? Imperfect Foods. If you, if you look up Perfectly Imperfect or Imperfect Foods, you'll find it. Uh, I, I think uh, I need to lobby the Catholic Church to go back to No Meat on Fridays or something like that. That um, was very, With you. very yeah. much in when I was a kid. We could change it to Mondays or maybe we could do Mondays and Fridays. But, yeah. um, if Mondays you know, Fridays. If you go to a restaurant and there's a soup of the day, there's always clam chowder on Fridays. And so that was the impact of a whole consumer set that wouldn't eat meat on mm -hmm. Fridays. Yeah. So yeah. If, we can mobilize, if we can mobilize, then we can create, you know, a ripple effect that, um, that there wouldn't be um, the meat offering on a day or a, another day, so. Yeah, you know, it, it, and some of the resources um, on that Meatless Monday, I would definitely recommend. They have complete presentation slideshows, you know, ways to get communities involved. So um, you don't have to invent that all yourself. I, I have one more question um, about the impact of um, fish, sustainable fisheries. Is, so you didn't, you didn't mention that. Yeah, on that chart, that little bit of an eye chart there. <laughs> um, oh, okay. Fish was kind of below uh, pig and poultry in terms of emissions. Okay, so, okay. So um, it wasn't Sorry, high that. on the list. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So let's end with a with a prayer here. I think we should just also thank Annette. This was a wonderfully yes. 
that, sorry. Yeah, that was great. It was just really, really good and really well put together. I'd love to get a copy of that um, chart that you had. I will give you the deck and there are links embedded everywhere. So you can go right to um, yes. our yep. world in data and see the actual chart. Thank you. Thank Thanks you for that. Too. You're welcome. Thank you. So let's end with a prayer. Source of life and blessing, of garden, orchard, field, root us in obedience to you and nourish us by your ever-flowing spirit, that perceiving only the good we might do, our lives may be fruitful, our labor productive, and our service useful. In communion with Jesus, our brother. Amen. Well, Amen. Amen. Let's say together, God's power working in us. Working in us does more than we imagine. Glory to God. God. Amen. Thank you, Annette. Thank you all very Thank much. You. Thanks, Annette. Bye, Annette. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody.